So next up will be Viv Preston from Maxwell Geoservices. Viv is the Managing Director of Maxwell Geoservices, a global data management consultancy providing software and services to the mining exploration industry. At Maxwell, Viv is focused on using integrated data sets from across a company to delivering op operational excellence, establishing efficient operational cost management and supporting the company's strategic objective of adding, adding value to the business. Bring, uh, Viv brings a wealth of geological experience to the data management process, having spent 20 years in the field. Viv holds a master's degree in geology from the University of Natal, South Africa. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, today I just want to just go through the practical application of the file that comes out of the XRF machine and, um, and just, just probably share with you some of the the things that we are doing in Maxwell in terms of making real-time decisions with that with that file. What what we wanted to do with the exit, so, and mainly this talks around expiration, no internet connection in the middle of nowhere. So how do how do we take that file and bring it into a system whereby we can interpret that file against all the other geological information that we're collecting? So the things that we wanted to look at was a real was a bush solution to integrating that portable XRF data in, uh, into a system. We didn't want anything fancy, didn't want anything that was going to take years to, to set up or, or train or expensive. Um, you know, setting up workflows around best practice, so a little bit what Dennis is talking about in terms of JORC 2012. Um, I think there's, there's some really good stuff that sits inside there and you know, there's a lot of data that should be collected if you're going to report on that data. So how do you do that? We wanted a centralised database. Often you're getting that Excel spreadsheet and you're having to work through a myriad of environments, applications to actually get hold of that data and do something with that data. We, we definitely wanted to do interpretation in real time. Um, and, this, and have seamless connectivity as best as possible with the applications that we are using in the field. And then once we've collected the data, we can analyze it and we can interpret the data. It's a little bit, I mean, most people, I mean, the, the people here are talking around these things as well. It's just setting up standard data management practices, um, collecting the data and the metadata. Certainly in the data management side of things, every single company can improve the amount of data and metadata that they, that they collect. We see people collecting um, reasonable amounts of data, they can probably collect a little bit more, and we, we certainly see people collecting the minimum amount of data, which in some sense makes that, that exercise irrelevant. Orientation studies, um, workflows, and importantly, understanding the geological environment in which you're working. I mean, it's absolutely fundamental that people understand the geology of where they're going to do their survey. If you send field assistants out there who've got no idea of the geology, you're probably wasting your time. Just as a point of, of, uh, of data degradation, so if, and, and this, is, this, is reasonably this is reasonably common in the data, we see it in the data management space where you, you, people collect a file and as it goes through the process, the relevance or the value of that data becomes less and less as we go through it. You know? So I mean, people are collecting the data and they've got a file. If we, if we just go down the bottom over here, we, we talk about you know the data's not captured. You know, are you collecting? You, you may you may be collecting the data, but are you collecting all the metadata to support that data that you've collected? And it's really, I mean, that data that you collected is as strong as the metadata that you're collecting. Um, the data is not streamed or, or stored, so it's common. We, we commonly see people have got this Excel spreadsheet, so this CSV file, probably converting it into an Excel spreadsheet, and then they've got no idea what to do with it. And they may cut and paste it into some GIS ap application, and it takes a long time for them to actually get that data and do something with it. Um, data not accessible, you know, it's residing in somebody's laptop, it's not within the organisation. Um, the data is not analysed correctly. People haven't done their, their um, calibration studies to, to really analyse that data. And basically, at the end of the day, commonly we find that data is not even used for decision making. So they go out into the field, they collect all this data, and then they won't even use it to make decisions in the field. So orientation studies, we've spoken a little bit about orientation studies. 
And as a previous, as Dennis was saying, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to understand what you're looking for, and you've got to understand, you've got to do the orientation studies to find out. In this example, the beam count. How long do, you, how long is the, the beam count necessary for a particular geological environment and a particular element that you're using? So in this case over here, if you've got a beam count of 60, 60 seconds, you're probably wasting your time looking at that data. I mean, it's so variable; it's all over the place. Yeah, and then you go to 120 seconds, it starts to get a bit better, and then, and then you go to 150 seconds, it's, it's not too bad, okay? So you've got to look at the practical applications of, of the gun in the field. So, you know, it's, it's, are you going to stick with 60? And, you know, when you start to, to um, image that up, it's probably going to be, you know, it's all over the place, or just have something around about um, 120 seconds, and, which may be a practical thing. Sitting around for a sample, 150 seconds is a long time, admittedly. QAQC, I mean, <clears throat> we have a system whereby you can look at your QC in the field. So here you can look at your standards and you can, okay, the one on the, the, the comparative chart is looking at laboratory values versus your PRX, your portable XRF values. Um, you can do all this in real time. The one on the right hand, on the left hand side is just to control charts with your standards. So just taking all that, and I suppose what, what, we, what we're doing in Max was having a, look at, having a look at how do you take that file and stick it into an environment which is connected to the rest of the, the operation. So here's an example of something that the farmers at farming community is doing where you've got a tractor and a file comes out of the tractor. So that file that comes out of the tractor, what do you do with it? You need some sort of hardware that's going to push that file out into the rest of the organiser, into the rest of the... Um, the operation. So in this little example over here, you've got the tractor, it collects its file, and it'll go, you know, it's going into the planters and the tillers and so on and so forth. And then you take all that information and you put it into the grand scheme of a, a farming environment. And that's, you know, the, people talk about the internet of, internet of things and so on and so forth. So how do we do that with a PXRF file? So here we've got We've got a file that comes out of the gun, and in our sense, what we've done is developed a little, a, a, an application called LogChief, and LogChief will pick up that file and host it in the database. So that the, the table structures in that database can, e can seamlessly accept all that information, put it into the database, and then what you can do then is that you can, you can, you can tie it up with all your your downhole tools, your sampling, your geology, your spatial, and you've got a, if you've got an internet connection, you can actually link it up there. So, you, so in a very short period of time, you're taking that file and you're linking it up with all the other activities that are happening in the field, and then you know, if, if, you, if you're connected, you can then put it into the rest of the organisation, or you may have to download it at some stage and bring it into, the, into your system. So Maxwell Sense, what we have is Datashed, and that's our master database, and in data there's a suite of tables, and those suite of tables have got portable XRF tables that will host that CSV file that comes from the, from the gun. And what we do is we would then use um, LogChief to... So generally what we'll do, we set up LogChief. So LogChief will take this, this, data, this data schema in the back end and move it in behind um, LogChief, and then you can go out in the field and you can log directly into a, a database which is um, a duplicate of this database, your, your master database. So just to reiterate, you can, you can, you've got uh, LogChief, you've got your, your, you've got your portable XRF, you can, you can, we've got a, uh, a plugin that'll allow you to take that file, that CSV file, bring it into, into LogChief, and then you can marry it up with various activities that are happening out in the field, and then you can then use that data um, to look at in 3D, we've got a small little GIS application that sits inside there, um, strip logs and so on and so forth. So that's uh, LogChief and LogChief allows you to do, um, you've got profiles that you can set up so you can end up with uh, like your drilling profile in how you've got various um, you have different profiles over here, so if you click on diamond, you get the logging tool. So if, if you're doing surface sampling, you can click on the surface sample profile that allows you to log into that, and then you have a, a bunch of apps. So here you've got an XRF app. So it's, it's, like a little, it's a bit like a smartphone where you can do, it'll, it'll log anything, 
and then you may have various apps that you may use in the field. So you, you've, got, you've got one container whereby you can do a whole bunch of work. So here you can, you know, so you, you've gone for your master database, you've extracted a whole bunch of data, some historic data, some planned data, that's sitting in the back end of LogChief, and then you can, you can highlight the data that you want to use in terms of a, a tree format or in a little GIS application, and that'll activate it. You can bring some geological maps in with your tenements or your claims. You can view that in, in, in LogChief. So it's all it's, it's, it's all its own entity. You're not having to go back to the office. You're kind of self-contained, and all this activity is happening on that one application or that one tool. Um, you can look at some historic information. You can you know, do you can look at drill hole collars, surface projections of drill hole collars. Um, you can view your data. So in, in, with LogChief, what we have is a little plugin. So that little plugin works. So as soon as, soon as, the C, as, soon as you've got that CSV file from the, from the gun, we just use the little plugin to take that CSV file and seamlessly load it into the database. And that'll do, no matter, you know, depending how you've set it up, it'll do all calibrations and everything. <clears throat> as an example, you can, uh, you know, with, with the, with, the with, with, with LogChief, you can go in there and, and do, do surface sampling. So you, you can run around and do your surface sampling. Um, you can either use your phone or you can use automatic uh, GPS collection. And so you can automatically grab hold of that sample point, bring it into the database, and on the fly, you can create heat maps as you're going along. So what, what, during that program, you can then have a look at your heat map and see whereabouts you may want to do infill sampling or so on and so forth. So, um, so one application, you know, shooting the gun, CSV file into the application, and then creating those images for, for you know, real-time decision making. Same thing with, with, with core. Shoot the core directly into LogChief, and then LogChief will create uh, strip logs if you want, and then you can also tied up into the into any mining application that you're running or you know, GIS application. So here's an example of, of some work that we've done in the Tenamai, the Tenamai Desert just recently. So we're just kind of working up in this area over here, no communications, no nothing out there. And uh, on, that partic on, on that particular time, it was summertime, so the temperature's around 50 degrees. And what, what we've done here, we've, we t we've, we've taken a... Um, some, it was, Tanama Gold had a, had a mine up there, and during the downturn, they got rid of the mine. They've, they've just gone right back to, uh, to grassroots exploration. So really, they've just taken all the historic data, put it all together, and have identified you know, 20 or 30 target areas that they want to go and follow up on. So it's, it's real grassroots exploration to try and see what's going on. So in, in this situation over here, you've got some historic holes through over here. You've got the Tanama Fault there. There's another interpreted fault running through here. And there's some interesting intersections um, around the place. We actually had done a, a survey along this line over here with, and with the XRF and got a couple of interesting results over here. So the idea was really to come in here and just do some infill work using the XRF and being able to make real-time decisions while we're in the field. In, in this particular case, we did lag sampling, soil sampling, and, and termite sampling. So. 50 degrees. We've got uh, log chief running on a on a on a um, tough book here, Panasonic tough book. Um, and what we've got is an XRF gun sitting in an upside down uh, ice cream container, and the gun sitting in there. We had a hat over the gun just to try and keep the heat off it, and we we're mixing the samples up in this vessel over here, and then once it's been mixed up, we actually put it into a little milk cap, had the sample, and shot this. And, and shot this, just trying to get some uniformity. So in terms of capturing the, the metadata, you know, we were capturing the metadata as we were going along um, with each of the samples. So what we've done then, so this, the survey, we did about 30 or 40 odd samples around here. And during the desktop studies, we looked at um, arsenic. Arsenic seemed to be a very good pathfinder. So the, the whole pro the, the program, although we collected a suite of samples, uh, most of it was around using the arsenic value and um, so there's, there's values over here that you can have a look at. 
through over here, and this seemed to be an interesting area through over here and over there. As a matter of fact, we did get a, a gold kick at this, in this sample over here and took a bulk sample and panned out a, ta a, a tail of gold. So if you do get a gold kick and you, it's controlled, go and have a look at it because there may be something there. Um, and so we, so we looked at this and you know, said, okay, let's try and do some more infill um, portable XRF values to get a better, better, just to find it a lot better than what it was at that stage. In this particular case, we were running map info on the Panasonic. So we were taking the XRF machine, putting it into the database, doing outside of the calculations, and then we were able to move the data into, um, in, into um, into map info and look at that look at the data in map info in real time. So you could do the same with with target or ArcView or Tutuk or whatever the case may be. Okay. And we just ran a profile across from here across to over here. And that's and that's what you're seeing over here. So what we've got here is um, this is the lag samples that we took. And these are the termites and the soils that was happening. Okay. So this this particular peak over here came from that sample over here, and this peak over here is, sorry, is in this area over here. So I just, you know, just wanted to go back and do some more on that. So I went, went back and did some more infill, <coughs> infill sampling. So here we've got all the historic information. We've got that high arsenic value um, with, with gold sitting over here. Um, and, you know, there's various anomalies over here, but I think what's also important over here is understanding the geology, because the, the, this, to the northeast of all this, there's subcropping material, so these, all these values are associated with subcropping material, and these anomalies are sitting over cover. So I think in terms of interpreting this information, you've got to understand your geology, so you can't relate these peaks with those peaks over there because the geology is completely different in this particular environment, okay? So from Max's point of view, you know, from our point of view, what we're trying to do is end up, is have a situation where people can do real-time interpretation of, of the data that's been collected in the field. So, you know, we, we've got uh, a tablet, you know, laptop, whatever it is, running, running um, log chief, and you can, whatever information you want can go into, into that back-end database, and that, that back-end database that can get streamed out, in, if, if, you, if required, can get streamed out in, in a web environment, and that web environment then there's a, it can be um, accessed by, by people around the, around the world or in your organisations. So just trying to get real-time data interpretation uh, in the field, have the quality control around it, um, all the procedures, and then being able to stream that out into the, the wider world. And that's it. Uh, thank you. I, I'd like you uh, to expound a little bit on your early in your talk statement that uh, where you essentially said if the geology is not well understood, the survey is a waste of time. Um, uh, I. I'm not a field person at this point in time. I'm a capital markets person, so I have to review what's presented to me by a company from 6,000 miles away, <laughs> particularly as far as geochem maps and that sort of thing. So how, how do you advise, uh, or what questions should I be asking of uh, data that's uh, produced uh, or put forward I think to we me go back to the competent people. I mean, yeah, is often the geochemistry is, is collected by incom incompetent, or people that can improve their competency. You know, I think I think there's a there's a tendency for us just to have a gun, go out there, shoot it, and then come back, and then the geologist sits in the office and interprets it, everything. I think it's really important that that the geology is collected as the person is is shooting the shooting the gun, and that information goes back. If you if you look at that that particular you know this particular slide here. Um, You, know, you can't compare this with that over there. No ways. Because this is all subcrop and that's transported. If that hasn't been disclosed to me, or do I need to do a site visit uh, in order to uh, satisfy myself that the quality of the data that's being put forward? Because 
that's not typically released in the press release. No. No, it's not at all. I mean, I, 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 as a, you, you just said the sorry, mate. <clears throat> as, as, as an organisation looks after data management, what, what, what I find interesting is that there is no audit on any database in reality. You talk about competent people, competent resource people, and, and you'll have um, audit committees and finance committees, but you never ever find a, a, a data audit committee. And what look? And I'm not necessarily talking about the data. I'm actually probably talking about the metadata. So I, I mean, I, you know, I suppose you've got to find somebody that you're comfortable with that'll that'll give you the truth about what's going on in terms of you know the answers that you want. Do you have to travel to site to have a look at it? I don't know. If you look at Briex, a lot of fancy people went and looked at Briex and, and didn't even recognise it at all. If the geologic model is wrong, does that mean that the data set is wrong? I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be wrong, but I think what's going to happen is going to take more time and more money to get to the point, to the, to the decision point. And I suppose that's what, that's what good data management is about, is actually being able to have sufficient data to make a decision in the appropriate time frame. And I think if you don't have appropriate data, and, and metadata in particular, I think the decision is going to be a lot longer and it's probably going to cost you a lot more to make it. And so as, as data managers, we like to capture as much information so that your decision is based on rich database rather than a, a poor database. But you're saying that we can rely on the sample data as being accurate as far as the uh, actual uh, uh, yeah, um, assays that are given by the machine. It, it's long as, just long as, long as the metadata is there, have the guys done their, done their orientation surveys? You know, can they dem demonstrate that they've done various orientation surveys in terms of, you know, um, as I say, the beam count, um, the various elements that they're chasing as pathfinders, um, you know, the calibration, the QC, all that kind of stuff. I think that would be the first thing I'd be asking people is, is show me all the, the orientation surveys that you've done and I think if they can demonstrate that, then they've probably got their heart in it, and the rest of the data is probably not too bad.